Transportation Authority to order and welcome everyone. Um, I, think, I know that we're expecting Commissioner Pierce, and I don't know about Commissioner Arnold. We're expecting both of them. So, um, so the first item is public comment. This is an opportunity for people to comment on items that are within our purview but are not on today's agenda. We will take public comment on the agenda items as we go through them. Is there anyone who would like to make a public comment this morning? Seeing none, the next item is the approval of the minutes from our July, from our April 15th, July 2nd, and July 15th meetings. Any comments? Approval. Motion by Commissioner Butt, second by uh, Commissioner Taylor. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Which brings us to the consent calendar. These are items that we will act on in one consolidated motion unless any member of staff, the public, or the commission wishes to remove an item. Is there anyone who would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Second. Motion by Commissioner Taylor, second by Commissioner Butt. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. So that brings us to item nine, and Ms. Willis indicates that Mark Watts is on his way, and so I suggest that since the people for items 10 and 11 are here, we will let them go ahead. And so let's move forward to item 10, which is the update on the financing plan re related to remarketing our series 2012A bonds and a proposed cost savings modification. Mr. Carlton. Uh, good morning, ABC Chair Tatson, members of the APC. My name is Randy Carlton. I'm the CFO for the authority. Uh, also in the audience this morning is Peter Schellenberger, the authority's financial advisor from the firm of PFM. Um, this item here is a, an update and to seek direction from the APC to recommend to the board. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, just a, a slight modification in the financing plan that uh, the board has already approved on how we're going to uh, go about addressing uh, the refinancing of our floating rate notes. You know, the board approved on May 20th a plan uh, to, to issue floating rate notes to take out the existing floating rate notes uh, in time for the December 15th mandatory tender. Um, you know, since then, uh, you know, we've been monitoring the market and a more cost-effective uh, alternative has emerged. Uh, cost-effective in two ways. One, uh, the interest cost for the approach that we're recommending uh, is lower. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at saving um, about uh, you know, 30 to 40 basis points. That's a significant amount of dollars uh, on this transaction. But we're also looking at saving future issuance costs. Um, as you know, um, a floating rate note type transaction comes to market every two years or three years or five years, whatever that, that term is. And each time there's some issuance costs. But we, uh, we are recommending an approach that will really uh, reduce that significantly. Um, the approach that we're talking about is uh, a direct purchase by a commercial bank of these, these notes. Um, it's been done before. Uh, we were actually um, you know, somewhat of a pioneer when it came to this type of borrowing when we did it in 2010 uh, as a public agency uh, negotiating directly with a bank uh, for the bank to purchase these, these securities. Uh, the banks will offer a more competitive rate than offering these on the public market because banks, uh, as a result of Basel and other banking reform regulations, now have to uh, invest their cash um, in, in, secu in, in securities that uh, will um, back up their deposits. Um, municipal securities are, is, is a form of investment. Uh, so they look for high-grade uh, municipal issuers like the authority where AA+. Plus, um, to, to buy their bonds directly. And uh, that's, that's the type of, of, of change that we're recommending. Uh, it's emerged over the last few months, uh, and you know, we believe that uh, it's a far more cost effective both in the short run and in the long run for the authority. And it's the staff recommendation that we uh, um, bring this to the board later in September uh, with, the, uh, with the resolution uh, authorizing this, this slight change in the plan. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Commissioner Arnerich? Uh, Randy, thanks for uh, doing sort of an in-depth real look at this and in your report. Um, 
So with the swap for the two hundred million, why wouldn't we just look at doing a floating rate to pair up with that, and for any of the balance do fixed? Um, why lump it all together? I mean, it's if the amount is two hundred, and we're looking at um, we have three hundred sixty-six million. So why why do a bulk? The three six the three hundred sixty six million is our total debt right. portfolio, and we have uh, some fixed rate debt that includes fixed rate debt and our floating rate debt. Um, we have a two hundred million dollar interest rate swap. I've right. been allowed to use that word one time in my presentation, so that's uh, I appreciate that, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that two hundred million dollar contract um, is is. Um, a way to look at it is it's a form of insurance. It, it pays us uh, a variable rate of money that is pretty close to the variable rate that we pay on our bonds. So as the market goes up, it pays us more, and we pay more on the bonds. The reverse is true. When, market is, when interest rates are down, we receive less off the swap, but we're paying less on our, on our bonds. So that to answer your question is why – uh, why not pair it at 366? Well, our 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 revenue stream is based upon a 200 million dollar right. revenue flow from off the swap, off, off the contract and the 200 million dollars obligation on the bond side. And uh, the last question then is: this, Then why, since the the shall not be named 200 million dollar instrument, we keep redoing it, but it. It is what it is, and it has its life that keeps going on. Is there a way we can tie this so we have to keep redoing this? Yeah. Is there an opportunity cost that we could gain by doing that? Right. Now, the, the swap itself is really untouched by all of what right. we're, we're doing uh, today. Um, uh, there is a way of getting out of the swap. There is um, a cost. We've looked at that cost. We've um, considered it. It's very expensive, and we chose just to hold right. them the swap to, to maturity. Um, to, um, to have the floating rate notes, you know, you're exactly right. There, there is a transactional cost associated with them that we incur, um, and that could happen at whatever interval that those floating rate notes happen to be set for. It could be a two-year period, a three-year period, four-year, whatever the most cost-effective place is the time when we're in the market for us to issue those floating rate notes is really the driving force in terms of how long it's going to be. Um, so what we're recommending today, and there, there's two ways of doing these floating rate notes. There's the, the public offering, which is what we did the in 2012. Then there's the, there's the direct purchase, like what we did in 2010. Uh, the transactional cost for the direct purchase, far less. Uh, there's, there's no underwriting. Absolutely, no no discount. Right, but is there any way we can? Is it just the marketplace such that we can't get longer than two to five year um, yeah. capture on this? The um, yeah, you know, we we would go as long as we possibly could, and and not disturb that that balance between the swap and what we're paying. Cause right. We can get a situation where you know the longer we go out, if it is five years, six years, or seven years, you know we're paying much more. We're paying up here when the swap has only given us, you know, mm -hmm. this amount of money, and that difference is additional costs out of our out of our pocket. Now, the the cost benefit analysis, I think, is what you, what you're getting at is, yeah, look at going you know longer so you're avoiding having to incur those you know, the three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar costs that might incur, um, so we don't have to do that every. Two years or three years, um, and 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 that that point is not lost on on us. We we, we fully understand that, um, and that's some of the thinking behind the direct purchase because um, you know we can negotiate with a bank. A bank may very well want to go longer uh, than three years, uh, and if they can get into the four or five six year time frame and still be within that um, relative balance of what we're receiving from the swap, then yeah, by all means, we'll we'll go as long as we possibly. Okay. Can. All right, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? And I just did, uh, Mr. Carlton and I had a conversation yesterday where I sort of said, given that this contract that shall not be named um, is, you know, is there and it isn't going away, 
was there an opportunity to just increase the size of the fixed rate offering? And you might summarize your response as to why you considered that, but then are not recommending that we pursue that approach. Um, well, it's uh, it gets to that same point I was just making. It it it, ten it upsets that balance. You know, we're only receiving a certain amount off the swap, and we need to structure the debt in, in a similar fashion to where you know we're we're paying about what we're receiving. So if we do something to change the size uh, of the amount of bonds that we issue on the on the bond, on the on the debt side, we'll have more debt. Right. And, uh, but I thought there was a tax issue as well. Well, there's also a tax implication. Right. Um, you know, derivative pro you know, a swap is a deriv derivative product, and um, those are not permitted by state law as a form of investment uh, for any public agency, unless um, unless there is an underlying form of debt associated with it. Then it becomes, and it's approved by the legislative body, uh, then it becomes permittable. So. Just having a swap out there on its own without a, a variable rate type of debt does does present um, uh, a matter of tax law and state law compliance. Thank you, uh, Randy. The, does it pay to kind of really quickly go back in time and talk about in 2004 when the measure was passed, but it wasn't the first dollar wasn't going to be collected to 2009. The board's decision to use these derivative products to then lock in interest rates so that we can jumpstart these projects that allowed us to get them ready. And then we got ERA Recovery Act, we got Prop 1B money versus not putting the money to work sooner. Yeah. And we might have missed that opportunity. So who knows what we what we say because we brought in, um, what is that, maybe 100 million, over 100, 100, 180 million of Recovery Act on the Caldecott Tunnel because it was ready to go, all these things. Is that, is that yeah, correct? That, that really speaks to why we one of the reasons why we did the swap, um, you know, back in, in 2005, um, you know, looking at a at a 25-year measure, um, you know, the idea is to gain as much um, certainty as possible in that long-term planning, and you know, the interest rate swap enables us to lock in uh, a long-term borrowing cost. So that took one of the equations off the table, um, and you know, you still have other other areas of risk, such as construction costs, construction timing, um, but if you could at least lock in one of your variables in terms of how much your future cost is going to be, um, then you know that that was that was one of the reasons behind the interest rate swap. So it uh, enabled us to right. So we, commissioners, based on based on my five and a half years here, I would never recommend this to you ever because of all the discussions that we've had. And so we've, we have moved on from right. this ish instrument and we've, we're issuing fixed rate uh, debt to pay for our construction program and, and, and everything's going great. Right, oh. um, Commissioner Arner, uh, Commissioner Taylor. I think he was before I was, sorry. I missed it. So are we going for two years? Five years, seven years, uh, as long as we can. It, it, uh, you know, currently we're thinking three years. Um, we'll what, have what a, the, but there's got to be a normal, or is there no normal? Um, it's 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 a free market decision. Uh, it's going to be based upon uh, what the banks um, propose. Uh, we will have a an open competitive RFP process. We will say, uh, you know, give us your your terms. Uh, and you know they will lay it out. You know they won't go any fur longer than probably six, seven, or eight years. But we will we will ask for whatever their terms are. We will see them and we'll make make a recommendation back to the board based upon what the most cost effective um, level and term is. So, so and, and, and 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 then you can help me. Is this competitive banks? Uh, yeah, it will yes. it'll, it'll so be to So it's, a, it's an open market right. and it's bids. Okay. Right. And, and so I, that, I'm just what, trying to. Right. What's in front of us today is a, is a recommendation to change the process. And then for them but, to figure it out. But then it'll come back to us with a recommendation of here are the bids we received, here's the one that's the best, here's why it's the best, but and that would still need board approval. Commissioner Arger. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to comment on the defense side, but I'm not mm -hmm. um, because of what our. Uh, uh, director's last comments were 
Um, but it does highlight something that I didn't see in the report that you verbally mentioned that I think it's important to realize. In order to have a swap, you have to have this and because uh -huh. of that. And you can't do it legally without it. So in a way, we're trapped. We have to do this. And, and I think we ought to be transparent about that yeah, because that's not in the staff report. And I, you know, I always forget about that aspect. Um, and not that it's good or bad. It is what it is. We need to recognize that, but we ought to have it in here why we're doing it. So it's not like, oh, we have a choice. The only choice we'd have would be to bail out of this, spend a ton of money, and it's not financially prudent. So we need to do this. We really don't have a choice. So maybe the, motion, maybe the motion yeah. to uh, forward this item to the authority could include a comment that a paragraph be added to the staff report making that point. Is there someone who would like to make a motion, or is there any further comments? Um, a motion that we, we with that. No. okay. It's a motion that we forward this recommendation to the authority with an adjustment to the staff report to just um, indicate that the reason we're issuing floating rate notes of some duration is because it's necessary uh, given the existing swap contract. Right. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Pierce. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. So since people's minds are in the frame of finance, should we continue to the other finance item and then move back to legislation? Okay. So that brings us to item 11, which is authorizing the issuance of a, up to $190 million in aggregate principal amount of CCTA revenue bonds for financing our projects, authorizing a partial refunding of our 2012 B bonds, executing all the related documents and taking all required actions. And these are fixed rate. Yeah, bonds, these correct? are your um, okay. run-of-the-mill, plain vanilla, very boring municipal form of bond. Um, fixed rate <laughs> captures, you know, the, the, the low interest rates in the market that are available in the market uh, today. But, there, you know, there's really two objectives here. One is to raise money for the ongoing funding of our capital improvement program. It's $100 million of it. And then the other $90 million um, is uh, going to be used to um, carve out some of our existing debt and refinance it at lower rates, and that will save us about $4 million in debt service, in future debt service costs. So, uh, you know, one may ask, well, why not refinance all the outstanding debt? Um, well, not all of it is financially feasible. It's no different than, you know, your, your home mortgage loan. Um, you know, if interest rates are at a point where um, it, it will save you money, you do it. Um, and, and that's the case case here. There, there's not one interest rate that's set for all the maturities in the bond structure. There's a certain area of that bond structure, the 2020 to 2025 maturity that is financially feasible to, to, uh, to refinance, and that's the part that we're going to carve out um, and, and save some future costs. So that's staff recommendation is to recommend this to the board for authorization. Okay. Are there questions or comments? Okay. I would just suggest that um, in the report that goes to the authority that you, again, include a paragraph indicating that we're not recommending refinancing all of the 2012 B bonds for the reasons you stated today. Okay. All right, there's a motion by Commissioner Taylor, second by Commissioner Arnrich. Is there any public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any, so I say it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank so you. now let's move to item nine, which is the uh, discussion of the legislative update. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you for and adjusting our schedule this morning. Um, I'm going to give you a quick update on where we are with the federal side of the house um, before Mr. Watts gives his update on the state, which is a little bit like days of our lives these days with everything happening up there. Um, but on the federal side of the house, um, Congress is still on its summer recess, um, scheduled to return next week. So it's been fairly quiet for the last five weeks or so. Um, before they left for their summer break, they did extend the Highway Trust Fund through the end of October to October 29th, 
and the Senate did introduce a six-year version of a reauthorization bill, um, but the House had quite a bit of opposition to it, so it, it just kind of sat there um, with nothing happened. Um, both sides, both the House and the Senate, have pledged that they are going to get some sort of deal done um, before that extension runs out on October 29th. It's a promise we've heard before. Um, and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee has said that they're getting ready to introduce their version of a bill that they say looks very similar to the Senate bill. So that, that could be very promising. It's still a very short timeline to get some sort of compromise when there are a lot of other issues and an election happening as well. Um, so this is going to remain a little bit of a game of, of, of wait and see for us. You know, I think that the Senate bill definitely had some items that we were really excited to see in terms of research and letters of no prejudice, and we're hoping that the, any version from the House will have something similar to that. Um, but at this point, we're, we're just waiting and watching and, and hoping that they can come to some agreement and the can doesn't get kicked down the road again for some period of time. Um, so that's what's happening on the federal side of the house. And um, Mark, I know that <laughs> we were talking as of this morning and things were, were still changing and updating. So I'm going to let you um, give an update to this, on the state side. Thank you very much. And glad I made it here on time. I've had a very stressful morning. Uh, just a little preface, uh, there's some very interesting news I'll cover at the very end about late-breaking uh, proposal between the Speaker and the Governor's office. But I kind of want to catch you up to how we got to this point. Um, you know, as you know, we were in a special session. Uh, there are two special sessions, one on transportation infrastructure. Um, there's been some activity over the last two months since the special session was called. Um, a number of bills have been introduced in both uh, houses, <clears throat> um, but only the Senate has been actively taking a look at some of the bills as they've moved through the last couple of weeks. Um, probably just a recap there on the Senate side, uh, Senator Bell, uh, you know, has probably the most prominent existing bill that's been out there, SBX 11 which generally raises about $4.3 billion and roughly shares it 50-50 uh, uh, between state preservation activities and local streets and road uh, maintenance and preservation. Um, there's other features to the bill. It relies on a 12 cent a gallon gas tax, uh, 22 cents a gallon diesel tax, and some registration fees, plus a new fee that looks like a registration fee, uh, but it's got a different name. So. Between the, uh, the the combination of all that uh, generates about $4.3 billion. Um, in addition, the Republicans in the Senate uh, from very early on uh, in the year and then in the special session have been pursuing what they call reforms to, um, uh, to transportation and it ranged from uh, some ideas on CEQA to uh, some uh, accountability and openness uh, reforms for transportation. Uh, so in the process of conducting the hearings, the senator or the chairman, Chairman Bell, uh, was uh, pretty much uh, guaranteed that his bill would move along, but he wanted to treat the Republicans with um, some level of civility and respect that uh, kept them in the game, and he did a very good job of that. They didn't pass all their bills, for example, bills that would reallocate high-speed rail or put high-speed rail bonds back on the ballot didn't pass. But uh, a couple of measures, one that would establish an Office of Inspector General did pass. Uh, there's uh, consideration underway for another bill that would uh, make some reforms to CEQA, streamline it a bit, uh, add in uh, advanced mitigation uh, opportunities for regional entities. So uh, he's been uh, marshalling his, uh, his house trying to get to uh, uh, an understanding between the Republicans and, and, his, and himself and Democrats uh, on moving a package forward. Uh, the Assembly has taken a slightly different approach. They've had 22 bills introduced, um, but none of the bills were, except for two, were re generally referred to committee. Um, the two key bills uh, that were introduced were actually spot bills <laughs> by the chairman. Uh, and interestingly, uh, Senator Bell also introduced two spot bills. And during the last week, both houses passed their pairs of spot bills 
to each other house so that they can either prepare to go to a conference committee based on a shell or they would have uh, vehicles ready if there was a, a, a package uh, a, agreed to at that point at some point in time in the next week. So all the parliamentary machinations have been completed. They're ready with the structure to move forward if there is, is going to be a package. Um, and overarching all this is the Senate pro tem's discussion on his bill, SB 350, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that establishes uh, new standards for, uh, uh, for fuel, for utilities, and for energy efficiency. Uh, for greenhouse gas reductions, accelerates the, uh, um, the or in substantially increases the goals to 50% uh, reduction in each of those sectors. And it is so overwhelmingly uh, dominating the conversation in Sacramento that I'm afraid that with the bill sitting in the assembly, that's partially the reason why the assembly committee's uh, uh, special session committee really hasn't focused uh, any attention to date. Um, Moving forward from that, I'll just go ahead and talk about last, yesterday afternoon, we were, I was called to a meeting with a few other stakeholders with the speaker, with Nancy McFadden from the governor's office and Secretary Kelly. Uh, they laid out or sketched out a framework of what the governor would endorse and that the speaker would uh, see uh, being carried. Um, it is somewhat structurally uh, aligned with Senator Bell's approach. Uh, I think it's um, fair to say it's probably disappointing uh, in terms of the um, amount. Uh, the bill, as they described it, would generate about $3.6 billion a year. Uh, they did say that they were trying to make it uh, a 50-50 uh, uh, share between state and local. But as they went through, uh, the 50% for locals included a freight program, local transit, and a new uh, Strategic Growth Council competitive grant program for complete streets to supplement uh, uh, road work uh, in cities and counties. And you can imagine that the league representatives and the CSAC representatives there didn't, when they subtracted it and realized that their 50% was not 1.5 billion, it was 750 million, uh, pushed back uh, quite a bit. There's some room for discussion and negotiations. The secretary indicated um, he might give up on the freight and add that to their side, but they haven't reached an agreement on that yet. They're not really in negotiating form. And I'm only free to talk about this now because I know two things. The secretary and McFadden, Nancy McFadden and the speaker were going to be meeting with uh, the Senate Democrat and Republican leaders on this package. Um, and brief her caucus. And in addition, it turned out the CSAC board is meeting this morning, so they were allowed, uh, you know, given dispensation to talk about this so that if they elected to uh, support it, uh, they, they, you know, that would give some momentum. Now, I'm not sure that that's going to happen, but you, you never know. And uh, definitely it will generate feedback to the governor and to the secretary and the speaker if there needs to be some changes or improvements before it's really rolled out in, in firm form. So that's kind of the status of where we are on that. <clears throat> uh, one bill I want to call your attention to in the assembly that has not really moved forward and it's in the uh, uh, special session is Mr. Levine's uh, measure um, ABX19 which deals with the Richmond Bridge. It's much more um, aggressive than the earlier version of his regular session bill. It basically says by November 1st, Caltrans shall open the third eastbound lane and make available the westbound uh, lane for uh, bi-directional bikeways. Caltrans has not embraced this, as you can imagine, uh, much to the frustration of Richmond and San Marin uh, uh, folks. As, as far as I can tell, the uh, business communities there are, are up in arms about the slow pace that Caltrans is taking with this project. So uh, I suspect that uh, unless Mr. Levine makes a, a real strong push, if there is a transportation package, um, this will just be left on the cutting room floor to be dealt with uh, administratively somehow. Um, I might mention that um, well, I was going to cover uh, probably the most um, Frustrating bill, I think, of the session, which is AB 194 by Mr. Frazier. 
that's the measure that would authorize tolling. Uh, there's an impasse right now between the self-help counties who are sponsors of the bill and uh, Secretary Kelly over the depth and breadth of how the state would be involved in expenditure plan development for potential excess revenues in a corridor. Um, they they want a, a stronger voice. They want collaboration, which they define as you won't take you staff won't take to your board an expenditure plan unless we've signed off on it and nobody's willing to buy into that. Um, the chair and the self-help county coalition as of last night um, were firmly saying no we'll risk a veto. The secretary has threatened a veto. He's actually threatened to find another author and run a bill with his language in it so we'll see how that plays out. Um, I hope that in the context of this larger package looming now with a week left to go in the session that the pressure points might be such that the self-help counties and the chairman might succeed in this um, but it's hard to say I'm not you know I'm not I'm not convinced that um, the secretary doesn't have a sound backup game plan that involves the veto threat so we'll have to see how that goes but um, in addition to this board, I recommend. I have another client that's very involved in this in Riverside, and we've recommended stay the course, uh, back the self-help counties uh, all the way, and see if Mr. Secretary has the ability to do what he threatens. So I'd be glad to take questions. Those, that's my report. Um, there's, I'm sure there's probably uh, a lot more I could talk about about the. The unfolding package, but and I'd be glad to answer questions okay. if there are any. And we'll, we'll take those. Is there any bill you want us to take a position on today, recognizing that by the time the authority meets the session, they will be over? No, but I had not discussed this with Lindsay. But if there is a financing package that, for example, self help or CSAC and League sign on to, would that be something you'd want to align yourself with? Well, it's something we can discuss, certainly. Um, all right, so, so I mean, that's I, something, right, so, so that's a good topic for discussion. Did you have a Do you have a yeah, Commissioners, I want to add a couple of things to those last last couple of bills. So one of the issues, I, I did call Caltrans on, on the Levine bill, and Mark is absolutely correct. You know, there's a there's push to add, add the third lane right away. There's some issues associated with, Geometry of the of Interstate 580, and so this project is not in the in the RTP, so it has to be amended into the Regional Transportation Plan, and Federal Highway Administration is going to weigh in because it's interstate. Those those things haven't been dealt with yet, so it's not like Caltrans is kind of slowing things down. It's in this case they're having to go through the process, and so we have been pushed for moving the bike path over on the other side of the bridge. But making sure that the analysis is done so when that when that uh, choke point is freed up, all that traffic is going to go into Contra Costa, and uh, it's the Richmond what's that called the Richmond Highway the Richmond Parkway. sorry yeah, Richmond Parkway so the, you know, there's an idea of building Ox Lane all the way through there and so that may be the next choke point so at least we understand when we say okay where the next choke point is going to be at least we can model that so that that's those are some of the things that have to occur they haven't taken a position but there is a big picture of the of the retaining wall that needs to be moved because it, it's very narrow through there and you and if you're going to speed traffic up around that curve you might have an issue on Melanie uh, Melanie's office so I did have a conversation with her on that project AB 194 the the issue there is the department isn't taking any risk. They're not putting any of their money on the project yet at the end of the day. And I think, Ross, you told me Orange County's express lane nets, what, a year? Well, uh, Riverside, uh, or not Riverside, Orange County, 91. I think the net, this is after operating costs, is $34 million a year. So no risk, but now they want to weigh in and they want a, a, a cooperation. <laughs> Terms. On their terms, and so that's why the at least, and with that, without your approval, we had a discussion with with the self help county coalition. It made sense to go with option A, and that is, we bring an expenditure plan to you, as a board, and you approve that expenditure plan because you're taking all the risk, and you're you're um, going to have to 
live with those results. And so we figured that's something that you'd you'd want, but I mean, we would love to hear from you that that's the way we should be going. Well, and, and the language does say that that would be after consultation with Caltrans. So the cooperation, as I interpret it, would be through some signed cooperative agreement or something like that. So this would be through consultation, and if there's dissent, Caltrans could come here and tell you their issues. That That's substantially different from saying the consultation takes place on Caltrans recommendation. Which is what I think you were suggesting is the Caltrans position. Yeah, they're, they're, the secretary's position is uh, they would not expect staff to bring anything to you that they had not signed on to. Right. Right. So they, okay. So I think that's you know, I mean, I, I would recommend that we um, support the recommendation that we stick with the current formulation of AB one ninety four. Um, Commissioner Pierce. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Further, I would say that we ought to uh, stick with our support for the coalition. Um, full disclosure, as your representative to CalCog and as the president of CalCog, I signed the letter from CalCog supporting the coalition. So at least in that respect, we're already on record in, in sort of a tangential way, at least, of uh, supporting the coalition. So assuming that was a motion. It was. Is there a fair there is a second from Commissioner Arnerich? Is there further discussion? Is there any other comments from staff? Before we finish the motion, I, I I do think that Mr. Watts had a good idea that should some package come together um, that looks like we could support um, before the board meeting that perhaps we run it by the executive committee right. to be able to put that's something on coalition. record. That's yes. the okay. That's okay. Just right, that's what we just Okay, right. not giant. Okay. Well, maybe further we ought to recommend sending a letter. I, or not. Would that it, be helpful? Uh, I'd like the flexibility to be able to consult as okay. things move. So okay. why don't we authorize staff to prepare a letter in consultation with Mr. Watts? Should that? Right, if needed. needed. Right. That works. Perfect. So that's Thank part you. of the motion. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. All right. Any further comment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck up there. <laughs> which brings us to item 12, which is the approval of the cooperative agreement with MTC for the Contra Costa I-680 northbound design alternative assessment. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Tats and Ross Chittenden, Deputy Executive Director for uh, the authority. And this is uh, really just an information item. Um, to alert you of a, an action that we intend to uh, bring forward directly to, to the authority on September 16th. Um, we've been uh, certainly been watching the uh, priorities as they develop out of the RTPCs to do something in particular on northbound 680, and we've been talking about this uh, internally and with some consultants for quite a period of time. There's a lot of ideas to explore. They haven't been uh, really vetted or haven't had a lot of traffic analysis or any engineering. So MTC has also approached us with this. They, they would like to partner with us. Um, one of the initiatives that they're talking about introducing in the next uh, regional transportation plan is something they call the Columbus Day Initiative, which is really their uh, kind of the next generation of freeway performance initiative. And unlike the last round where they kind of spread everything like peanut butter, they want to focus on three corridors, 680, 880, and I believe 101 in the North Bay. So we believe that uh, as a result of this proposed study that that could turn into significant support if we choose to go to a 2016 election ourselves, as well as the potential to leverage some pretty significant dollars if MTC does their Columbus Day initiative. So just an information item. Uh, Susan's working with uh, MTC staff to uh, prepare an agreement. So this would be a, uh, uh, an agreement. The uh, current estimate for this study is about $300,000, and the proposal would be we'd split it 50-50, and it would be funded from contingencies that are on the current uh, uh, HOV lane project uh, through Walnut Creek. So I'll... Susan and I will be happy to answer any questions today. Uh, information only. You'll see the details on the 16th. Are there questions? Um, thank you yes. for doing this. Are you, Ross, going to be the one involved in helping uh, steer this uh, effort? 
Susan and I will be in it. Um, I've, uh, uh, I don't want to call them any wild or crazy ideas. Maybe they're some innovative ideas yes. that we want to explore. <laughs> right. Good. Well, I just want to make sure. But thank so, you for helping get this. So, so how, if at all, will this study be linked with the existing study going on? Um, it on would, we need to uh, link at least three studies that are occur uh, occurring on the corridor, two on the corridor and one more general. Uh, we have our express bus study. We have the 680 transit study. We have this, and yes, we need to bring this all together. There's been quite a bit of discussion with, uh, I, I know Susan and Lindsay went down and met with some of the staff in the San Ramon Valley area. Uh, we, we really need to bring it all together into one package uh, under a single umbrella. You know, it's really, uh, you could almost say it's starting now. I'm sure you, if you've driven the corridor, you've seen some construction activity, some orange fencing down there. That's the beginning of MTC's express lane project. So uh, actually, I shouldn't say that's the beginning. The uh, Ox lanes came online last year. Now we'll have the express lanes. 680, 24, interchange northbound is a choke point. That's what we need to address. That no, uh, unless we go off 680, nothing we do is going to fix that. So this is really geared at addressing the northbound 680 choke point. Okay. Are there other comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any commissioner comments? And commissioner comments? Commissioner Pierce. Yeah, uh, sorry, I was a little bit late. The uh, traffic now that school is back in session is a nightmare. Um, just for the information, up, so well, it's yeah, it's uh, Treat Boulevard even was backed up past Cowell this morning, which is just absolutely outrageous. And, uh, and Ignacio Valley was backed up beyond uh, Alberta and Pine Hollow in Clayton. So that was... Uh, Awful. So all the back streets are getting the side <laughs> traffic, and Concord is paving many of them. So that didn't help either. <laughs> anyway, uh, I apologize for being a little bit late, but um, I assume that our director and and Randy Carlton gave the report that we met with the rating agencies yesterday, and our uh, financial advisors are here. So we're going to get the first report back tomorrow, due to a quickly approaching vacation for one of our folks uh, on uh, Standard & Poor. They'll have an answer to us tomorrow on that rating. So uh, we're progressing to see how we fare in the marketing. I uh, also wanted to report that Supervisor Anderson and I participated in the Speaker's Roundtable on August 19th, had an opportunity to present our bid for more money and, and uh, due diligence from the state to progress. I don't know that we accomplished anything given Mark's report today, but we tried. And lastly, I would like to wish happy birthday to our executive director, Randy Iwasaki, whose birthday is today, and to Randy Carlton, whose birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday, happy birthday guys. Happy we birthday. Happy birthday. Absolutely. So, and anybody else whose birthday is coming up shortly. So um, thank you for all you do. Any other comments? Any uh, other staff comments? Commissioners, I have a, I have a couple comments. One, I, we didn't get to the rating agencies because okay. our, our time in the sun is, or mine is at the end. So, uh, <laughs> that's, out we, activities. yeah, we did have a great <laughs> meeting with the rating agencies. Fitch was the other rating agency, and they know us very well. And we've met with them, like I've met with them at least five times. You probably have met with them more, Randy, but they've gotten to know us pretty well. One of the one of the Fitch person persons. Actually, Karen lives in Orinda, loves the Caldecott Tunnel. We actually took all the rating agencies, the people that we met with, had walked through that tunnel during construction, so they get to see firsthand what that investment does. I wanted to mention we, we're using reclaimed water on, on all of our projects that we AAA, we advertise, award, and administer. And I, I asked, we asked, uh, we thought it was a great idea to use reclaimed water, so Ivan took the lead, and it took him three months to, to get this done. We thought if we were citizens, we could literally go in the back with our pickup, fill up the, the tank and dump the water on our plants or whatever. if we're going to do compaction, we could use that. 
this was just a, a very arduous process that and then Mary Pifo, Supervisor Pifo, got involved, uh, Senator Member Frazier. I got a call from Phil Batster. He was the acting general manager for the Iron Horse, Iron House Sanitation okay. District. And I said, I thought you were the city manager yeah. over in yeah. Hercules yeah. or something. Right. But he says, I'm, I'm doing this now. And he goes, what's taking you so long? And so I, I was I was on, uh, I was was on, talking to Ivan, and Ivan um, professed all the complications. And so I called Phil back, and I said, you're part of the problem. And then Caltrans actually had to do a sweet pea analysis, stormwater analysis. That tells me that they weren't using reclaimed water. I'm not sure they are today. But we are, and so all the dust control, all of the compaction is being done with reclaimed water. There's a big tank out there. They actually run little trucks to the tank at night and fill it up, and then during the day they, they uh, use that for dust palliative or dust control. So we're, we're helping the drought, hopefully, there rather than to fill up at the hydrants. We, we, we were notified that we got some excess dirt on one of our projects. I think it's the Hillcrest 3B. Worked with Caltrans in conjunction, apparently, the mayor, Brentwood asked to have the right-of-way mode because it looks unsightly, and the, the whole corridor has been relinquished to the state, but some of the individual par parcels are still owned by either the bypass authority or in, maybe in some cases Brentwood. Anyway, it took three, three weeks or four weeks to get this decision. Finally, at the end, Caltrans was finally convinced that, that they could allow dirt to be piled there. And they said, we, we'll, uh, we need to have an MOU. You need to do us uh, an environmental uh, reevaluation of the entire facility or whatever it was, and we're going to charge you rent. And so then, then by that time, we went to Brentwood. They do have a piece of property, but we needed an encroachment pit, but it's too late. So the free dirt now is, is being hauled off to another site, and we're going to end up paying for it because we need dirt on, on Balfour. So that's uh, something that we worked on. So one is a success story, even having to go through the old, our old our old team, Ross, reclaimed water, but the dirt is not going to happen. And then the thing that we talked about last night, and I'll say it again, we, we have a little over a million dollar grant for federal money to help the cities deal with with uh, some work that they're doing on this planning area, and it was like $1.048 million. And so it needs to be, after you get your E76, your approval for, to use federal money, now what, what's happening is we had to get a Caltrans audit, which took a couple of months. So in the meantime, in order to get, because you, you, want, you want success early, you don't want us to wait around. We started the process, and after the audit, we, it was determined that we spent $44,000. Because we did that and we didn't have Caltrans' approval on a federal contract, it's ineligible. And so we're, we had to take an item to the planning committee last night to, to use measure money. So we're, we're talking to Caltrans again to try to, get them to waive that process. But for five years, the chairs of the of the com group that goes to Washington, D.C., that's number one, is letter of no prejudice. Let us take the risk, and if it's we get a clean audit, then pay us for all the work that we've done. And so we're, we're fighting that issue as well. So good news story and two not-so-good stories. So I, and, and then uh, thank you for supporting us. We always enjoy that. And then the last thing, good news, the great news story is, as we mentioned before, you said don't do the, the CTP, the Comprehensive Countywide Transportation Plan, the same way. And so on the outreach side, through our process, we got more comments this cycle than the last 25 years combined. We were recognized by digital government as Best of California Awards 2015, most innovative use of social media and citizen engagement. This is a national award that, that Lindsay has helped us get. So. Last night I said thank you for all the work that you do, and I'll say it again, thank you for all the work that you do. But this is a reflection on the new way of doing business at, at the authority. So thank you. Oh, and we have one other item. We, we did brag about Lindsay yesterday. I know it was embargoed till today, but we bragged about you at the rating agency yesterday. <laughs> And, Chair, I'd like to just have, make one other quick comment. Um, uh, please look at item, uh, item 13 in the planning committee packet. Um, it's not an action item. It's not on your agenda. It will be uh, brought forward on the 16th. That is a, an amendment for the uh, Gray Bowen Scott uh, contract related to the countywide transportation plan and adding some additional activities related to the transportation expenditure plan. Um, it's a, a fairly significant amendment. Uh, had some discussion at uh, at the planning committee uh, last night, and we will expect that there'll be some discussion at the authority meeting. So, 
Uh, please uh, read that. If you have any questions, you can contact, uh, depending on the topic, uh, Martin, Lindsay, or I, we all have services put in that, uh, and we'll have that discussion on the 16th. Thank you. Is there any other business? So, so I have one item I just wanted to bring up. Um, you know, certainly the weather forecasts indicate we could have a significant rain year, which would be good news. Um, in our town, we were already beginning to see you know, to trees start to fall over. And so to some extent, a lot of rain can put even more stress and other problems. And so one of the things I would ask the authority staff to think about, and maybe when you meet with the uh, city engineers periodically, is to think about is there a coordinated way that we can put together uh, using our network of contractors, the opportunity to respond and help the jurisdictions quickly if we have some significant storms this year that cause widespread damage. Yes. So, okay. we'll, we'll think about that, Chair Katzen. That's a great – I have talked to the engineers about this. And when I worked for Caltrans and, and we were gearing up for winter, if we had an El Nino, we were out, number one, cleaning ditches. Number two is making sure your culverts are inspected and clear. Because if they're not, you're going to blow, as, as you saw there in, in Lafayette, you had a little, little sinkhole. So pay attention to your drainage if that's going to happen this year. Even when you have clear drainage, every now and then something collapses. And it's, it's good if, if we, using our good contacts of being the preferred vendor, have a group of contractors we could call on and would get our jurisdiction's quick response to resolve these problems. Yeah, I, 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 Ivan and I will take that as an action item. Okay, thank you. Well, and further, um, you know, the last time we had El Nino and torrential rains, there were some significant landslides right. on major arterials. Um, and that year I asked for and we got from the state a addition to our allowances for STIP money to be able to use that to repair the landslides that affected um, the major arterials. And I don't know if that's still in effect. It would help if we had STIP money in the first place. Back then we did have, but um, I think that was one of those things we worked on. And we might take a look at how we might be able to help some of those local jurisdictions if they get into trouble that way. I don't know whether it's going to be through that or some other source or maybe we we look at an emergency fund. I don't know. So, Commissioners, what, what normally happens is, um, and if you're referring to Ignacio Valley, when I was at Caltrans. No, it wasn't used, Ignacio Valley. You know, when, it was actually a local street in Clayton. So, Ignacio, when I was still at Caltrans, we helped the county get ER money because I knew Gene Fong very well, the FHWA person. And he, they deemed it as an ancient slide, but you got ER emergency relief money. And you have to go through the, the ER process. And we can do that, but it's a reimbursement. So one of the ideas that, that I have just right, right now is, if we have cash in the bank, we could actually loan that to the city and then make sure if it's ER eligible, emergency relief eligible, it has to be on the federal aid system, an FAS approved route, and then we can bring the money um, back when we, we get reimbursed. That's one, that's one way of doing it. On a local road that's not a federal aid, California state law, and that's what happened on Via Verde, we went to my friends at um, Calima and they, they deemed it a lack of maintenance, but ultimately they gave the city, I think they reimbursed you for about $9 million of that repair, which was about $12 million. So we still have some contacts with Calima. We still have some contacts with the Federal Highway Administration, and so we can help you through that. And there may be an opportunity or way to loan the city some money if they don't have it in their in their coffers. But if, just with, think about it. Yeah, know. just think, I think just, you know, we've got a few months to think about it before heavy rains are likely to hit. Commissioner Taylor. Just a question, Ross, uh, for info, because we've already ordered sandbags. We're cleaning Marsh Creek. We're, we're trying to be very, very proactive because we're also having trees just fall. Yeah. Just exactly. fall. Right. Yeah. And, uh, my question, uh, when you compose a list, do you send that to the agencies? Well, what uh, we... In other words, how do we get... How do we get yeah, well, so if we could... Uh, yeah, if we could get a, a you know, large enough pool of folks that buy in, we'd just solicit contractors who want to be put on a list, you know, by type of work. So you could have small contractors to do certain things, but larger contractors if you had... 
major event. So it, we, we it would be basically, well, this is what we did at Caltrans anyway. You just have a list of contractors. Some happens, you call them up and negotiate. You'll get the list of prices. Yeah, that's what we would work to do is uh, try to get some pre-approved prices and those kind of things. I mean, as an indication of how this worked in the last storm, we, we had a large, very old um, culvert that collapsed. And we didn't really have any flooding, but um, access to 100 homes was cut off. Including really the soon, mayors. Including the, the then <laughs> mayors, right. Um, and so I contacted Randy, and, and we had two contractors out there. And this is the December storm, and it was fixed before Christmas. Yeah. And Arinda had a similar problem, and they fixed theirs in November of the following year. Right. So. Well, and a suggestion, perhaps this is something that you guys could take to the PMA and suggest to them that they, you know, initiate getting a coalition together, if you will, and, and get us some buy-in ahead of time so we can work on, on collaborating on those things. We've talked about other things we can collaborate right. on. Maybe this would be a good place to start. The, the way I would approach it, because every contractor wants to work in an emergency, what, what, if, there's a, if there's a disaster, you have two tools. One, you can declare an emergency and hire a contractor and pay time and materials force account. Or you can do what, what Don did, and he, he solicited two, 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 bids, two right. bids and then looked at, because he had, you had emergency, you declared a state of emergency, so the contract act is thrown away. And you, he, you actually chose the better of the contractor that you thought they could do the work the faster, so that was your performance criteria, but it might have cost you a little bit more. But time, speed, the expertise. So if you have a problem, bridge falls down, we can, we can give you three names of three contractors that will fix your bridge just like that. And then you can choose whatever tool you want to procure. That's really the city's or the town's decisions, how you want to deal with that. And, and, and the advantage for us is Yeah, so, so PMA meets next uh, Thursday. I'm attending. I'll bring it up. And then uh, CSAC, the Engineers Advisory Committee, they meet the following Thursday. And whoever attends that, I'll bring it up there. I would just be a little cautious uh, with the PMA. Um, those are our city managers. Um, instead of letting them do the heavy lifting, we need to have those conversations with our city managers because... Right, but, but I'm just saying that I think um, we need to talk to our counterparts and make sure, because I think it puts staff in a little awkward position. Yeah, I, I will. But it, it would be good that we kind of set the table for that because... I think there's a, our city managers have a tendency to be a little skeptic about things in general. Um, and I think we need to help um, say this is something we want. And I think it will change the, the ear will turn a little bit um, quicker towards that this is a, a real plus. In that case, we are adjourned until October 8th at 8.30. Thank you. Thank you.